Welcome back. This is uh, our last presentation for today. And then we will have, of course, our Q&A after this presentation. Uh, I'd just like to mention that um, the question that was asked about uh, Nahum 1 verse 13 and Jeremiah chapter 30, I'm going to answer that in our Q&A tomorrow, in our first Q&A tomorrow, because I do have some material in my computer. I don't have my computer here. So I'm going to answer uh, that question first uh, in our session, a Q&A session next, uh, cla after the next class tomorrow. Um, also, there's a question about uh, the signs, which we ended with, the signs and the sun, moon, and stars. I'm going to print out uh, the information that I have on that so that you can clearly see that uh, there's a difference between the signs in the sun, moon, and stars in the past and those in the future, according to Matthew 24, verse 29. So now we want to end our study of Revelation 18. Uh, before we do, we want to have a word of prayer, as we always do. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege now of meeting once again. We realize that your message is a strong message, but you speak strongly because you want us to listen to what you have to say. If you just spoke softly, maybe we wouldn't be willing to listen, but you speak with a loud voice so that we can place our lives in your hands and live according to your will. I ask, Lord, that you will bless us as we study the last part of uh, Revelation chapter 18. That you will give us, uh, at this late hour in the afternoon, clear minds, and that you will give us open hearts. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we are on page 133 page 133, and uh, we're going to comment now on verse 4 of Revelation 18. It says there in Revelation 18, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. And now the reason is, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. So why do the plagues come? Because of the sins, right? The sins of Babylon. So God says, get out. And of course we noticed in verse 3 that Babylon is in a terrible condition, filled with demons, according to what uh, Revelation 18 verse 2 and verse 3 says. Now the purpose of the loud cry is to proclaim the fall of Babylon and to call God's faithful people out of Babylon before the outpouring of the seven last plagues. An angel come down from heaven to the earth to proclaim that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, but it is God's voice that calls, calls his people to come out of Babylon. So the mighty angel that descends with a loud voice is an angel, we don't know the name of the angel, but the person who calls the people out of Babylon is Jesus. He says, come out of her, my people. Now, where are people being called out from? Well, they're actually being called out from the three parts of Babylon. First, from the secular world. Second, from the papacy. And third, from apostate Protestantism. So the call out of Babylon does not only apply to people who are in the Roman Catholic Church, it applies also to Protestants. Notice this next statement from the writings of Ellen White, Great Controversy 382. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to religious bodies that were once pure and have become corrupt because it says Babylon is fallen. Well, if it's fallen, it must not have been fallen before, right? Since this message follows the warning of the judgment, it must be given in the last days. Therefore, listen carefully, it cannot refer to the Roman church alone. 
So does the call to come out of Babylon only a call for Catholics to come out of the papal system? No, it includes Protestants. And in other places, Ellen White says that it includes worldlings. Those are secular people who are neither Protestants nor members of the Roman Catholic Communion. So once again, therefore, it cannot refer to the Roman Church alone, for that church has been in, fall, in a fallen condition for many centuries. So this must refer to another group of people at the end besides those who belong to the Roman Catholic Communion. Furthermore, in the 18th chapter of the Revelation, the people of God are called upon to come out of Babylon. According to this scripture, many of God's people must still be in Babylon. And in what religious bodies is the greater part of the followers of Christ now to be found? Without a doubt, where? In the various churches professing the Protestant faith. So we need to understand that the call that God gives, that Christ gives, come out of her my people, applies to everyone who belongs to the threefold union. Kings, rulers, which are secu the secular people. Secondly, those who belong to the papal system. And three, those who are members of the Protestant churches that have fallen from the truth that God gave Protestantism. God wanted Protestantism to progress and to grow in their knowledge, to fully restore the truth. But somehow the process got truncated and as a result, Protestantism lost its way. Now, we're on page 134. We must understand the call to come out of Babylon in verse 4 in the light of the Old Testament literal parallel. Do you remember when Babylon was about to fall? We read repeatedly in Isaiah and Jeremiah where God called His people to come out before the fall of Babylon on that fateful night. Well, that was what literally happened, and that becomes a shadow, or it becomes a type of the call out of Babylon at the end of time. God's literal Israel in the Old Testament were called to come out of literal Babylon in order to escape her doom. However, they were not merely to leave Babylon without any particular destination. <laughs> you know, God doesn't say, get out of Babylon. They say, okay, where are we going? Why were God's people called out of Babylon? To go where? To go to Jerusalem, hello? So when God calls all of these individuals out of Babylon, He calls them out of Babylon to join where? To join the remnant church, God's end time Israel. In other words, God's end time remnant. So they were to come out and to go to Jerusalem. So today we call people out to join God's remnant church. And of course, this will happen in a spiritual sense at the end of time. God has a global spiritual Israel, and the devil has followers in global spiritual Babylon. And the call will be given for the wicked to come out. Now in Prophets and Kings, pages 715 and 134, Ellen White speaks about a spiritual Israel. It shouldn't surprise us to, to talk about spiritual Israel. You know, the Bible tells us that to be an Israelite means to belong to Christ. If ye are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed. It has nothing to do with your ancestors. It has nothing to do with the blood that runs through your veins. It has to do with your relationship to Christ. If you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed. In other words, there are individuals who are not physically Jews, but in the sight of God, they are his true Israel. Notice how Ellen White refers to this in uh, Prophets and Kings 715 and 134. No longer have the hosts of evil power to keep the church captive. She's talking about the 1260 years of persecution. For Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, which hath made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And to spiritual Israel is given the message, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of his sins, of her sins, and that ye not receive of her plagues. As the captive exiles he heeded the message, flee out of the midst of Babylon, this is Jeremiah 51, and were restored to the land of promise, 
So those who fear God today are heeding the message to withdraw from spiritual Babylon, and soon they are to stand as trophies of divine grace in the earth made new, the heavenly Canaan. Isn't that beautiful? Now let's go to verse 5. It says there, why people need to get out? For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. What, what are Babylon's iniquities? Well, I have a, a brief list here. This is not a complete list. These are the main sins that characterize end time Babylon. First of all, pride and arrogance. It's the same pride that Nebuchadnezzar showed when he says, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for my glory, and so that everybody look at me as this great builder? I'm just paraphrasing. In other words, Babylon is an arrogant system. In fact, in Isaiah 47, Babylon says, I am seated queen, and I shall not see widowhood. Neither will I lose my children. It says there in Isaiah 47, this is what uh, the harlot Babylon says. What is the second sin? Crass materialism. You can read this in Revelation 18 verses 11 to 14, which we're going to go to in a few minutes. Another sin is giving wine of false doctrine to the nations. You find that in Revelation 14, 8, 17, 2, 18, 2 and 3, etc. The fourth sin is fornication between church and state. That is one of the great sins of Babylon. Another one is persecution of God's people. And you have several references there in parentheses. And another real negative sin or terrible sin in Babylon is practicing the art of deception through sorcery. And we're going to come back to that word. It's a very interesting word. It's the word pharmakeia, where we get the word pharmacy from. Very interesting. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Revelation 16 describes Babylon's plagues. The culmination of her punishment comes during which plagues? The culmination of her punishment. Well, the first four plagues are punishment to Babylon, right? But what is the climax of the punishment for Babylon? Oh, it's when the darkness covers the earth. And when the multitudes withdraw their support from the leaders of this system, and when you have these phenomena in nature, that's the moment when Babylon especially is punished by the Lord during the fifth, sixth, and seventh plagues. And you have the references there in parentheses. Now you notice it says here, for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. We are not to understand the word remembered as God suffering from some sort of temporary mag uh, amnesia. God does not suffer amnesia. He says, oh, you know, now I remember that I'm supposed to uh, punish Babylon. No. God has been aware of Babylon's sins all along. And they have been what? Accumulating. You can read Jeremiah 51 verse 9. The divine ledger has been adding up. And when her sins have reached the limit that God has established... God will remember, that means God is going to execute justice, execute punishment. God's remembering must be understood in the sense of God delaying the ultimate punishment until the cup of iniquity is full, until the straw, the final straw breaks the camel's back, to use another expression. That is to say, God delays punishment, and when the cup is full, He what? He remembers. <laughs> it's not that He's forgotten all the way along. Remember means simply that God is now going to execute justice because the cup is full and the straw broke the camel's back. One is reminded, now come several examples. One is reminded of the doom of the cities of the plain. Do you know that God did an investigative judgment of the cities before 
they were actually destroyed. You can read that in Genesis 13, verse 13, and Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. God says, I will descend and see if they've gone too far. That's what he's really saying. So in other words, God is performing an investigative judgment of the cities to determine if they have filled the cup or if they have put the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Notice Ellen White's comment on this in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 60. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was on account of their great wickedness. They gave loose rein to, the intemperate, to their intemperate appetites, then to their corrupt passions, until they were so debased and their sins were so abominable. Is that true of Babylon at the end, according to what we studied? Yes, that their cup of iniquity was full, and then God remembers. It says, and they were consumed with fire from heaven. Does God keep a ledger of every nation on earth? Yes, he does. Does God give each nation a period of grace to see if that nation will fulfill his will? Absolutely, including the United States. Does God do the same thing with churches? Of course, with the exception of the Adventist church, right? No, no exceptions, no except. The will of God must be fulfilled. Now notice this statement about how God deals with nations. Prophets and Kings, page 364. With unerring accuracy, the infinite one still keeps account with the nations. While his mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account remains what? Open. But when the figures reach a certain amount that God has fixed, the ministry of wrath begins. The account is closed, divine patience ceases, mercy no longer pleads in their behalf. You remember the Amorites in the Promised Land? This is another example that God keeps a ledger of the wickedness of nations. When they reach a certain limit, God says, no further. Notice Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 208. Of the Amorites, the Lord said, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. That is Abraham, uh, actually Jacob and his sons would come back to the land. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet what? Full. In other words, they had not sinned away their day of grace, to use the expression that Ellen White uses. Although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled up the cup of its iniquity, and God would not give command for its utter destruction. The people were to see the divine power. Would that be comparable to the loud cry? Did the people in Canaan did they have an abundant light that God was with Israel? Of course they did. Did they hear that God had sent ten plagues upon Egypt? You better believe it. Did they hear that the Red Sea had swallowed up the Egyptians? Absolutely. Did they hear that God was feeding Israel with, from the bakery in heaven? Absolutely. Did they hear that in the desert, in the wilderness, water had come from a rock? Did they hear that their shoes did not, did not wear in the wilderness? Yes, they had every evidence in the world that God was with Israel, and yet, like it's going to happen at the end of time with Babylon, they become entrenched in hardihood. And so the quotation continues, the people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner. Do you think that the, the, the nations of Canaan heard about Jericho? You know, just marching around the city, boom, down it goes. They say, oh, we're in danger. But instead of recognizing that God was with Israel, they hardened their hearts. So it continues saying, um, the people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with their iniquity until the fourth generation then. If no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to fall upon 
them. The next statement Ellen White wrote about the downward slide of the Protestant world into apostasy. Has Protestantism become a lot worse since the days of Martin Luther? Yes. Much, much worse. You know, people love what the world loves. And basically, there's been an adoption of doctrines that Luther and Calvin would have never believed that would come into the church. Notice this statement from Ellen White. The professed Christian world is advancing as did the Jewish nation, from one degree of sinfulness to a greater degree, refusing warning after warning, and rejecting a thus saith the Lord, while crediting the fables of men. What is the greatest fable of men that the Christian world has embraced? That Sunday is the day you're supposed to keep. She continues, the Lord God will soon arise in his wrath and pour out his judgments upon those who are repeating the sins of the inhabitants of the Noachic world. You know what happened to the world in the days of Noah? Every intent of the hearts of men was only evil continually. In fact, the whole civilization before the flood committed the unpardonable sin. Did they have abundant light? Of course they did. Noah's preaching. Building a transatlantic ship on dry ground when it had never rained. And they made fun of him. And even at the very end, the, the people see these animals coming two by twos in perfect order. To Noah, it's not like the Hollywood version where Noah's sons are ha, ha, they're pulling these animals with ropes into the ark. No, no, they're marching in perfect military style, the animals into the ark. And even then, they rejected the message to come into the ark. They were beyond repair, and that will be the condition of Babylon at the end of time. So she continues, those whose hearts are fully set in them to do evil, as were the hearts of the inhabitants of Sodom, will like them be destroyed. The fact that God had long forbearance, patience and mercy, the fact that his judgments have been long delayed, will not make the punishment any less severe when it does come. What about the United States of America? Has God given great light to this nation? Folks, the greatest light in the history of the world has come to the United States of America. Here the truth has been taught in its purity, Ellen White says. And yet what has happened with the United States? It has been unthankful to the Lord. Notice this next statement that we find here from Review and Herald, May 2, 1893. And there's another one that we're going to read later on that is uh, July 4. Uh, she wrote for the Review and Herald for the Independence Day where she actually amplifies what we find in this quotation. This is what she wrote, the people of the United States have been a favored people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countenance to popery, that is to the papacy, the measure of their guilt will be full. When is it that the cup is going to be full? When is it the last straw that's going to break the camel's back? It's when the United States imposes Sunday, the papal day of worship. That will be the final drop in the cup. And what will God do? The measure of their guilt will be full. And what? National apostasy will be registered in the books of heaven. The result of this apostasy will be what? National ruin. Are we advancing towards that? It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. They're all in the same boat. On the way to perdition because they have totally rejected the light that God has given to this magnificent country 
such as never has existed in the history of the world. You know, sometimes I sit down and I almost cry when I see how God lifted up this nation to have a base from where the gospel can be proclaimed to the whole world and what eventually is going to happen with this nation. It is sad. We're going to page 137. On the other side of the coin, the same could be said about the relationship of God with his people. Now here's the good news. See, the bad news is that the cup is going to fill for the United States of America and for Babylon, but on the other side we need to talk about God's people. We can say the same about God and his people. As his faithful children are suffering to the utmost in the time of trouble, and God seems to have forgotten them, he will remember his covenant and deliver them. Amen. Let's go to Exodus chapter 2. This is when Israel is in bondage in Egypt. Exodus chapter 2. You have the references there in uh, your notes. Exodus chapter 2, and let's read verse 24. Exodus chapter 2 and verse 24. 24. It says there, so God heard their groaning. Is God going to hear the groaning of his people during the time of trouble? Yes. yes. So God heard their groaning. And God what? <laughs> so, so it's good when God remembers his remnant people. When he remembers Babylon, that's a problem. <laughs> so it says, so God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. So to remember them means to acknowledge them, and then of course he intervenes to deliver them from bondage. Now let's go to verses 6 through 8. Babylon's reward. Let's read the passage first, and then we'll read a statement from the writings of Ellen White. Render to her just as she rendered to you. In other words, what she rendered to God's people, now she is going to be rendered. And repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself, and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, here's Isaiah 47, I sit as queen, and am no widow, and will not see sorrow. Well, Babylon, think again. Revelation 18 says that you will have great sorrow. And then verse 8 says, Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judges her. That's why you don't want to stay in Babylon. <laughs> because she is going to be repaid, primarily for what she did to God's people. Notice Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 62. Fallen angels upon earth form confederations with evil men. In this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ, and then the law of God will be fully made void in the nations of the world. Rebellion against God's holy law will be fully ripe. When is it that rebellion becomes fully ripe? She says, it's when what? When rebellion against God's holy law, then the nations will be fully ripe for destruction. But the true leader of all this rebellion is Satan, clothed as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him to the place of God and deify him, but omnipotence will interpose. And to the apostate churches that unite in the exaltation of Satan, the sentence will go forth, and now she's going to quote Revelation chapter 18, verses 6 through 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, 
death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Notice also Isaiah 47 verses 8 and 9, which was alluded to in the passage in Revelation chapter 18. Therefore hear this now, you who are given to pleasures, they're speaking about Babylon, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. <laughs> is the harlot going to lose her children, the support of her children? Oh, absolutely yes. Is she going to lose the support of her lovers? Yes, that's what this is talking about. And then God says, but these two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries for the great abundance of your enchantments, which of course has to do with spiritualism, right? Sorcery and enchantments have to do with spiritualism. In other words, she was immersed in spiritualism. Babylon will be a widow, widow because she will lose the support of her lovers, the kings, and she will lose support of the children, the Protestant denominations. Both her lovers and her children will turn against her. And that's what Daniel 11.45 means when it says she will come to her, her end with none to help. Of course it's, called, it's talking about the king of the north. Uh, the masculine is used in Daniel 11, but the king of the north is the harlot of Revelation chapter 17. So now let's go to verses 9 and 10. This is the lament of the kings, the lament of the kings. Let's read those verses. The kings of the earth who committed fornication, who did they commit fornication with? With the harlot, right? With the apostate church. And lived luxuriously with her. What are they going to do at this point? They will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, and of course it's been identified as the harlot, the woman is the city, right? He's talking particularly about the papacy. It says, uh, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Now the Greek word judgment that is used here is the word krisis, and it refers to the execution of the judgment. It's not talking about the investigative judgment, it's talking about the execution of the sentence that was proclaimed in the investigative judgment previously. It's the same word that is used in Revelation 17, 1, where God says to John, come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. Really it should be translated the condemnation of the great harlot, or the implementation of the sentence against the great harlot. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary explains the meaning of the word krisis. Whereas chapter 17 deals primarily with the sentence against Babylon, chapter 18 is concerned with the execution of that sentence. What would the expression at a distance mean? No doubt this means that the kings now realize that they have been collaborating with the harlot and that what they've been doing was deceitful. They should never have done it. And so whereas before they were in bed with the harlot, now they're keeping what? They're keeping their distance. They don't want anything to do with her. When we no longer want to be associated with someone, we say that we distance ourselves from them, right? In other words, the fate of the kings is inexorably bound up with hers. They did not listen to the call to come out of her, and therefore they shared in her sins, and they received her plagues. This is a, a phenomenal time of history, isn't it? All of this that is going to happen. Let's go to verses 11 through 16. Verses 11 through 16. These verses describe the extreme anguish of the capitalist merchants when they see that their trust in Babylon has all been in vain. 
Let's read those verses. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of the most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble and cinnamon, cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and fragrance. Uh, and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. Notice how the list ends. Bodies and souls of men. We'll come back to that in a few moments. Lots of products are mentioned here, right? Lots of products that the merchants have sold. It continues saying, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, who became rich by her, will stand at a distance for fear of, of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet. That's found in Revelation 17, right, to describe the harlot? So it says, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. That's a quotation from Revelation 17 verse 4. That's how we know also that Revelation 18 is amplifying what we find in Revelation chapter 17. And, and it says in verse 17, for in one hour such great riches came to what? Came to nothing. These verses describe the reaction of the merchants of the earth when Babylon falls apart. Those who weep and wail are called the great men of the earth. In that day the Amazons, the Facebooks, and the Googles of the world will see that the accumulation of wealth at the expense of the poor has cost them eternal life. The wicked don't lament because they have sinned. They lament because they have lost their riches, and with their riches they have lost eternal life. Time and again, as the plagues are being poured out, we are told that the wicked refuse to repent. At the bottom of the page, Ellen White describes the reason for the lamentation of the wicked. The rich bemoan the destruction of their grand houses the scattering of their gold and silver. But their lamentations are silenced by the fear that they themselves are to perish with their idols. So what is worse? The fact that they're losing all their goods or the fact that they're going to lose their life? It's the fact that they're going to lose eternal life. In Great Controversy 654, the same page of the statement that I just read, she writes, the wicked are filled with regret, not because of their sinful neglect of God and their fellow men, but because God has conquered. They lament that the result is what it is, but they do not repent of their wickedness. They would leave no means untried to conquer if they could. What a picture. You know, chapter 17 doesn't give us this picture. See, it, it, to, to catch the full picture of what's going to happen, we have to look at Revelation 16, which talks about the darkness. It talks about the drying up of the waters. It talks about, uh, you know, the waters avalanching themselves against the wicked, and also the phenomenon in nature under the seventh plague. But that doesn't tell us anything about the reaction of the people when that happens. So in chapter 18, God says, I'm going to tell you what the people are going to act like when they realize that they're lost. So we have a building pattern. 16, chapter 16, is amplified in chapter 17, is amplified in chapter 18, and we're going to find the fullest amplification in chapter 19, where the, after this trial, uh, God's people are going to be in heaven, and they're going to be praising the Lord because He has judged and avenged the blood of of his people. We'll come to that a little bit later. Now we're going to skip the next, next paragraph because uh, we've read that one before. Uh, this is also in the chapter, The Desolation of the Earth, where Ellen White is commenting on Revelation chapter 18. This uh, is where she says that people will become bitter 
against the ministers because unfaithful ministers have preached smooth things. The multitudes will be filled with fury. They will cry, uh, you know, we're lost and you are the cause of our ruin. We read that uh, once before, so I'm not going to read it again. Now let's go to the middle of page 140. The extreme anguish of the wicked is expressed with several intense Greek words. You know, you would think that uh, probably John would use just one word, you know, they cried out or, you know, they, they bewailed, but there's several Greek words that are used to describe the anguish. Let's notice what those words are. The extreme anguish, anguish is found in the word klio, which is translated bewail in Revelation 18. And you see all there, there all of the verses where this word appears. It also appears in James chapter 1, chapter 5 and verse 1. Remember we read that passage describing this period? Then there is the word pentheo, and that word is translated mourn there in Revelation chapter 18. The third word is kopto, which means to lament. That word is used also in Revelation chapter 18. Then we have the word krazo which means to cry. It's the word that is used of Jesus crying out in anguish on the cross of Calvary. So I think that what God is trying to get across is that this is going to be a time of severe anguish. All of these synonyms are used to describe the crying out, the anguish, the bewailing, the mourning of all of the wicked who have lost eternal life, have lost everything that they had. It's interesting to notice also, now we're at the top of page 141, that we're told in Revelation 18 that, the, that in their angst and affliction, they're actually sprinkling dust upon their heads. What does that mean, sprinkle dust upon your heads? It means extreme affliction and suffering. And you, you see that there are some texts there in parentheses. You know, if we read all these texts, we would, wouldn't get through half of what we're getting through. But you'll notice in those texts that throwing dust on your head is a sign of affliction, tremendous affliction. Uh, and so we find also a list of the merchandise. Now, um, what is included in the merchandise that is described? There's several, uh, several items that are mentioned. Some of them are necessities in the ancient world. Some of them are commodities and some of them are luxuries. It includes, this list includes basically all or most of the items of trade in the ancient world. And it represents the fact that the capitalists exerted total control of the world economy and therefore lived in luxury. So basically this list includes almost all, if not all, of the products that were, that were sold in the ancient world. There are 28 items mentioned on the list. Some of the items, like I said, are staples and others are luxuries. The list includes items that were common in the days of John. God spoke to the prophet in the context of his time, right? What would God say if he called a prophet today to give the perspective of what was going to happen during this time? Well, you would have the prophet speaking about stocks and bonds, he would be talking about iPhones and iPads and widescreen televisions and fancy vehicles and also mansions. But John is speaking in the language of his time. So that's why all these things are not mentioned. But does the principle apply that everything that people leaned on is going to be taken from them? Absolutely. So the main point is that before her fall, Babylon had a stranglehold on the commerce of the world and use it to oppress God's people. Now here's an interesting detail. At the very end of the list, you have the fact that Babylon uh, also trafficked in the bodies and the souls of men. The bodies would refer to the present physical life. Many people lost their lives as a result of Babylon's persecution. While the word soul refers to the spiritual future life in the kingdom. Jesus used two words in this way in Matthew 10 verse 28. 
And do not fear those who kill what? The body. What does that mean? Don't fear those who are able to kill the body. It means who are able to take away your present physical existence. So who are we supposed to fear? Well it says, but they cannot kill your soul. What can't they take away? They can't take away your eternal life. In other words, to kill the body means to take away your present existence, your physical existence. To kill the soul would mean taking away your eternal life. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul, in other words take away your eternal life, and body physically in hell, which is the word Gehenna. Elsewhere in Revelation the word souls is used to describe those who are killed for refusing to practice the false words of Babylon. Babylon not only traded in the physical bodies of human beings, but also toyed with their very salvation and eternal destiny. Are you catching the picture? Now verses 17 through 19. Now we have the lament of the employees and the travelers that worked for the capitalists. It says every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. And of course the context of this is Tyre, where the commerce was done in ships. And so it's actually referring back to Ezekiel chapter 27, it's using that symbolism because that's the way that commerce was held back then. But would it apply in principle to the commerce at the end of time? Would it apply to more than just commerce on the sea? Of course. Now let's go to verse 20. How are God's people going to react when this happens to Babylon? How is heaven going to react when this happens to Babylon? Verse 20 now switches the scene. <laughs> now the scene is turned to God's people in the midst of this crisis. It says in verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven. So how does heaven react to what's happening? Oh, they rejoice. And you holy apostles and prophets, for God has what? Avenged you on her. Are the, are the last three plagues the avenging part? Remember we said judge and avenge? The martyrs say until when do you not judge and avenge? The judgment portion, in the investigative judgment a sentence was pronounced in favor of God's people. But they're still dead. When is it that they are rewarded and they are avenged over this harlot that they did these things to them. It is during the last three plagues when the wicked will wail. By the way, this hymn that is sung in heaven will be picked up in the very next chapter. In verses 1 through 10, we'll find an expansion of the song that is sung in heaven by the holy apostles and the prophets it says here, besides the heavenly beings singing because they have been delivered from the harlot from Babylon. Now let's go to verses 21 to 24. When Babylon falls all of the activities of the city cease. It says in verse 21, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. By the way, this comes from the book of Jeremiah. We're going to notice. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found you in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. 
and the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all who were slain on the earth. Does this hark back to Revelation 17 where it says that the harlot is full of the blood of the saints and of the martyrs of Jesus? Is this the same time period that's being described in Revelation 18? It's the same time period, folks. Each of these chapters is uh, related to the period of the fifth, sixth, and seventh plagues. Each one gives uh, details that the other does not give. Now, the picture of the stone being thrown into the sea finds its backdrop in Jeremiah 51, 63, and 64. Jeremiah chapter 50 and chapter 51 are an oracle against literal Babylon in the Old Testament. And God tells Jeremiah to do something very strange. He says, take a stone, which represents Babylon, the literal city of Babylon, and you take that stone and you throw it into the depths of the river Euphrates. In that way, Babylon is going to be drowned. Is there the idea of drowning in the book of Revelation? Of course there is. The waters are dried up and then what? And then the waters avalanche themselves and they drown Babylon, so to speak. Remember what we studied about Israel at the edge of the Red Sea? You know, the waters, when the waters were united, they were inimical to God's people. But when the waters dry up, a way is prepared for the escape of God's people. And so God's people escape, and then not only do the waters dry up, or are the waters divided, but then once God's people have gone across the sea, what do the waters do? The waters drowned the armies of the Egyptians. That is in the background of what is going to happen at the end of time. So it says, and it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. The stone, of course, is so that the, so that the scroll, which is Jeremiah 50 and 51, will not come to the surface, because Babylon is not going to exist anymore. Verse 64, And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. So the stone is a metaphor of Babylon. The stone, of course, with the, with the scroll. She will be drowned in the waters of the Euphrates. The waters will dry up like the waters of the Red Sea, and then avalanche themselves upon the apostate Babylonian system. All the activities that characterize a city will cease when Babylon falls. Now here's an interesting tidbit. Babylon deceived the nations by her what? Sorcery. We already read that. It's the Greek word pharmakeia. What word do we get from pharmakeia? We get the word pharmacy. Why does this word appear? This word appears only in this verse and in Galatians 5 verse 20. But a cognate word, which is pharmakon, is used in Revelation 9, 21, 21 verse 8, and 22 verse 15. The word denotes the use of magic, often involving drugs. Do you know that in antiquity people took drugs to enter altered states of consciousness? And they couldn't think straight because they were in altered states of consciousness. And so the word denotes the use of magic, often involving drugs, and the casting of spells about the people. Did Babylon do that? Did the harlot cast spells on people? In apostate Protestantism, they deceived people. The people drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak. The simple fact is that those who visit Babylon's pharmacy are not able to think straight. That's the bottom line. Verse 9 of Isaiah 47, But these two things shall come to you in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. Is this alliance going to be torn apart? The harlot, the children, and the uh, 
the kings of the earth that were her lovers. It's going, the city is going to be divided into three parts. You remember we read that, that particular verse? Now, let's notice the last paragraph, because time is running out. The great sin of Babylon is that she persecutes God's people and sheds their blood. This is the picture in every one of the Antichrist passages that we find in Scripture. It's found in Matthew 24, verses 14 and 15, where God's people have to flee because they're being persecuted. It's found in Daniel chapter 7, verse 21 and verse 25, where we are told that the little horn persecuted the saints of the Most High. It's used in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 24, where it says the little horn broke the saints of the Most High. It's used in Daniel 11, 44 and 45, where it says that the king of the north goes out to kill and destroy many. It's used in Revelation 13, verse 7, where it says that the saints of the Most High were killed during the 1260 years. It's used in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 6, where it says that the harlot is filled with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. And it's used in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 20 and verse 24. Let's read those verses. Chapter 18 verse 20 says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged, avenged you on her. And notice verse 24 says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. What is the great sin of end time Babylon? It is the persecution of God's people. And God will not tolerate it. God will intervene and he will say up to here and no further. So the prophecies folks are comforting to God's people. Amen. You know we've noticed a lot of negative things that are going to be going on at this time. But what is the bottom line? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. In other words, the whole purpose of prophecy is God saying, listen, there's going to be a real hard trial ahead, Babylon is going to be judged, but the good news is that you, if you form a personal relationship with me, you have absolutely nothing to fear, because I will intervene, and I will deliver you. What great news. Amen.